Welcome to session 3B. So this, pro this particular session is about a project that UNIVIDER did. The title of the project is Changing Nature of Work and Inequality. Apologies, the, nature, the title of this project is different from what's on the program itself. And the project was done in association with IBS, OSA, and DPRU, UCT, uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And I'm going to just give you a bit of an overview about what the project is about before we get to the, each of the presentations. So moving on. The next slide. So to give a background and motivation of this project, we know in recent years we've seen a sharp increase in wage inequality in many developed countries. While the early literature had focused on the role of skilled bias technological change, SPTC, uh, as is widely known now, the recent literature has been highlighting the importance of routine bias technological change, RBTC, RBTC in short. RBTC leads to a depressed demand for workers involved in routine tasks that can be now executed by computer technologies. And what's really interesting about this literature is that it puts the occupational change at the forefront of understanding the effect of technological change on wages or earnings inequality. But we also know, and this is big, the big limitation of this literature, that much of the, the existing literature you've seen has been focusing on, the, on developed countries, US, continental Europe, and so on. And we know very little about the effects of technological change and routine task intensity on earning inequality in developing countries. That's a big, big gap in the literature. So this is the reason why last year, UNIVIDER, in association with DPRU and IBS, launched a cross-country project in, uh, with the focus in countries in the Global South. So this project, let me now turn to the main research questions for each of for the country case studies. So we had three, four research questions. First research question. What do we know about earnings inequality and occupational change in developing countries? Second research question. What has been the role of routine bias technological change in explaining changes in occupational structure and earnings inequality? Third research question. What role have country-specific factors, minimum wages, trade unions, structural change, and so on, depending on the country in, in, in question, have played? The thing that was important about this project that we made sure that each country case study, and you, I'm going to hear a favor of the country case studies today, had to address each of these three core questions. So that made the project comparative, so we can learn lessons about what's happening in the Global South. In terms of country, the countries that we studied in this project, we had four from Latin America, Argentina, you're going to hear about the Argentina case study later today, Brazil, Chile, and Peru. From Africa, we had three, South Africa, and we'll hear the South Africa presentation later today, Tunisia, which is also there in the session, and Ghana. Asia, we had four country case studies, Bangladesh, which, which is also in the session today, China, India, which is also in the session today, and Indonesia. So you had 11 countries. And the important point about the country selection was first, as you can see, we covered the global south, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. The other point that's important to keep in mind that we chose countries where most of the workers are outside agriculture, or at least are moving out of agriculture, because this literature is not really applicable for countries where most of that workforce are still in agriculture. And that's important to keep in mind why we chose a set of countries. You also had a global case study, which is also going to be presented today, uh, Peter Lewinsky, Albert Park, and Simone Scott. Now, before I ask the presenters to present the six papers in, in, in sequence, a couple of logistical points. One, well, you probably know this by now, this is the third day of the conference. Each presenter has math eight minutes, and uh, also questions should be uh, uh, sent to me I was actually sent to all, all the presenters and, the, and myself to the chat function. And I will collect the questions and then we're going to ask, I'm going to ask the questions on your behalf. But the other point, which is a difference from previous sessions is, you could have the question and answer sessions after three papers are presented. Three papers, a Q&A session, three more papers and a Q&A session. The reason we're doing it this way is because the papers, as you're going to see, have similar methodologies. And in a sense, it's better to bunch the uh, papers because one, there may be questions asked of more than one paper. So you're going to have this three by three, uh, three, three model. However, if there are any questions on clarifications, then I will make sure that I'll answer this question, we answer this question right away, because we don't want anyone to have any confusion on the methodologies staying on for the rest of the session. So apart from clarificatory questions, other questions will be kept after three papers are presented. I hope that's clear. The other point, just to make uh, this clear, is this, this session is being recorded. Okay, let's start with this, uh, the first of the six papers, and that's by Simone Scotti from the UNU Okay, so 
Thank you very much for the introduction, Kunal. Um, I hope you can all hear me well. Um, I think there's some echo. Um, okay. So the paper that I'm going to present is joint work with Piotr Lewandowski from the Institute of Structural Research in Warsaw and Albert Park from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And as the title suggests, we're interested in estimating the global distribution of routine and non-routine work in this paper. So as Kunal has mentioned in his introduction, economists have been interested in analyzing the past content of occupations in, over the past two decades, more or less, and specifically having an interest in how the twin forces of technological change and globalization, specifically offshoring, are shaping the nature of work around the world where though most of the literature so far has focused on the US as well as other industrialized countries. So at the methodological level, um, the most widely used measures of routine task intensity of occupations draw on ONET data. So ONET is a great database. It has very detailed information about occupational demands, abilities, skills required by occupations, which allow researchers to have a good idea of the task content of an occupation However, the big drawback is that it's only available for the US. So it's a US expert survey, essentially. Um, which means that structural differences between countries, particularly between low and middle income countries on the one hand and high income countries on the other in terms of technology adoption, skill supply, um, infrastructure, productivity, et cetera, will not be accounted for when just using this data to have an understanding of the tasks of occupations in this poorer country, so to say. And there's an important question as to whether the same occupation has the same task structure in various countries, given these important differences. And that's something that we're trying to tackle in this paper. So our, what we're doing is we draw on a companion paper by Piotr Albert and co-authors who have used survey data from three surveys, which is the PIAF collected by the OECD, mainly for developed countries, though not only, um, the STEP survey collected by the World Bank, mainly for low and middle income countries, and the CULSS, which is the China Urban Labor Survey, which has questions that are very similar to PIAF and STEP. And what they do in this compounding paper is to start with the US PIAF and find a combination of questions that are very close to the measures um, of routine task intensity based on ONET. And in this table, you kind of see those elements that are used to get an idea of the non-routine and routine task content of occupations, which are then combined into this routine task intensity measure, the RTI, which is higher the more routine intensive an occupation. Um, so with this data, using this survey measure for the 46 countries, we are able to get already an idea of how different occupations are in their task content for the set of countries, which is nice and a good addition. However, um, there's a number of large low-income countries or middle-income countries, such as India, Brazil, South Africa, for which this data is still not available. Um, so they do not allow us to get a fully global picture. Therefore, what we do in this paper is to estimate a range of models which relate the occupation-specific RTIs to the country's level of economic development as measured by GDP per capita, technology as approximated by the share of internet users, skill supply measured by average years of schooling, and globalization measured by um, how narrowly the country is specified in terms in their global value chain contributions. Um, so we use this model then, these models, to make out of sample predictions for those countries where we don't have any survey data yet. And in the scatter plot that you're seeing, the red dots um, are our predicted values essentially, and these gray dots are the actual survey measures. And what you're seeing is that generally less developed countries are characterized by a higher RTI of jobs within the same occupation in comparison to high-income countries. And interestingly, this gradient with GDP is quite steep, especially for the high-income, high-skill occupations, such as here in the example of ISCO-1 managers, but also ISCO-2 professionals, for example. 
So what this implies is that a manager in, say, Ghana has substantially more routine intense task portfolios than a manager in, say, Germany. And given this finding, what we are we're trying to tackle a second research question, which is to use our calculated and predicted values to get an idea of the evolution of RTI across country groups across the 2000s. And to tackle this second question, we merge our RTI measures, the country-specific RTI measures, um, with ILO employment data for 87 countries, which together account for about 75% of global employment. And what we are able to show with this is that when using ONET, um, essentially all countries are shifting away from routine towards more non-routine um, work. So this is kind of this gray line here, which you have seen where you have this declining RTI across countries. However, importantly, once we account for the fact that especially those high school occupations are substantially more routine intense in the low-income countries compared to the high-income countries, we see that the routine task intensity over the 2000s has essentially been almost flat in the low-income countries, um, which implies that this reallocation of labor from less productive routine towards more productive non-routine work has occurred much slower there and has been quite far, especially in the high-income countries, leading to a rising gap in the routine task content of occupation. So it's actually not narrowing, but rather widening. And this would be essentially overlooked when using the ONET measure, assuming the tasks are the same across countries. And from this, we conclude that using the ONET essentially overestimates the rule of routine replacing technological change and kind of calls for um, increasing technology adoption, raising skills supply in these countries. So let me close here. And as Kuna was saying, the other country studies are going to dig deeper into some of the country cases also using our country-specific RTI measure as well as the ONF. Thank you. Thanks, good morning. Let's move on to the first of the five country case studies. That's on Tunisia and Spong Le Min. Spong Le, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Hi. So can you hear me? Okay. Hi, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Fung Le Ming, and I'm glad to present our work on earnings inequality and changing job natures in Tunisia. This paper is co-authored by uh, Mohamed Ali Marwani, Michel Machalian, and me. And next slide, please. Thank you. So in overall, we observed a steady decline in earnings inequality in Tunisia labor market over the last two decades. So at first glance, the aggregate data suggests that the potential determinants of inequality change work in opposite direction. More precisely, in one hand, the decline in education premium associated, especially education premium associated with high earnings jobs, with high earning jobs, and the increase of the average RTI are in line with the reductions of inequality. But in another hand, the changes in occupation distribution appears to increase inequality before the revolutions from 2000 to 2010, and then it shows an ambiguous impact after the revolution. So when we perform the polarization test, we fail to find job polarization, but an L-shaped patterns of earnings revolution. So that is to say, look, earnings increase at the lower end of the earnings distribution, but stagnated at the upper end of the distribution. Since the public sectors, including public administration and public uh, enterprise, has critical role in the Tunisian economies, uh, we try uh, removing the public sectors from our data set. And interestingly, we find a job polarization in the private sector and also a wage polarization. So together with the increase in average RTI over time, we suggest that the other driving forces might have greater impact on the earning distribution than the routinization. So next slide, please. 
and here to measure the impact of um, other like of uh, all determinations on the earning distribution of Tunisia labor market, we decompose the changes in earnings distribution into the contributions of main determinants using the recenter influence um, function. So you can see here during the first period from the 2000 to 2010, the public sectors played the main role in reducing inequality, especially in the 50 times wage gap. And also the decline of education premium relating to the high income jobs also helped, helped to reduce uh, inequality at the upper end. We can see here in the first period, occupations or routinization has a disequalizing effect, but it was uh, counteracted by the education and public sectors. And during the second period, it's after the revolution, although the public sector still absorbed around 20 to 22 percent of the active, pop active population, and wages in the public sector were held at higher level than the private sectors, it had no equalizing uh, impact on, on the distribution, earning distribution. And both routinization and education increased inequality of uh, the 50 10 wage gap. And here we can see that from 2010 and to 2017, most of the decline in inequality in Tunisia uh, comes from the improvement of gender equality. So, next slide, please. Thank you. So, our main findings here is that um, the dynamics of Tunisia labor market are characterized by the four main factors. The first one is the decreasing uh, earnings inequality. The second is the L-shaped wage polarization, and then the increase in the share of high-skilled jobs until the revolution, and then its decrease. And finally, the same pattern with the average RTI. And what we what we found is that this trend were mostly explained by the form of education premier, employment and wage policy in the public sector, and routinization. And finally, one thing we didn't highlight here is that gender equality improvement in Tunisia. So that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I should have mentioned that you're doing a PhD in the University of Sorbonne. In the Spanish and so on. Thanks. Uh, very good. So we will also let's move on to the next presentation. That's by Saima Bidisha, who's at University of Dhaka. Saima, go ahead. Good afternoon or good evening. Um, my uh, paper is about the changing nature of work and inequality, the case of Bangladesh. Uh, basically, uh, if we look at the uh, cases of economic indicators for Bangladesh, Bangladesh has been doing quite well in terms of a number of indicators, especially if you look at the GDP, uh, for the last five years or so, the country has been able to uh, have a GDP of more than 6.5%, which was quite impressive. However, if you look at some other uh, indicators, then there remains concerns. And one uh, concern area is that of labor market, because it is often argued that the country's growth experience has not been translated into the labor market outcome, and there remains bottlenecks in the both supply side and the demand side. Uh, based on this background, uh, in our paper, actually, we try to analyze some of the selected labor market indicators, and for that, uh, we have used 2005, 2010, and 2016-17 labor force survey of data, and also combine it with the own aid data. Uh, the methodology is similar to the other paper, so I'm not going into detail. Uh, uh, we have found, in terms of the result, uh, there has been some interesting results. For example, in terms of the inequality, uh, although we have adopted a number of indicators, uh, although not very consistent, but in terms of Gini indicator, what we have seen that from 2005 to 2010, uh, it remained almost same, but in the later years, there has been a falling shred. Uh, now, if we look at the other uh, indicators in the data set, then we have uh, uh, what we have seen that there has been the concentration of worker in the mid-skill occupation and the, in the secondary occupation. And over time, there has been a 
increase in the mid, mid skilled occupation uh, people as well and uh, the tertiary level occupation although they are enjoying a high education premium uh, their proportion is very small so from that point of view the result seems to be more or less consistent with the other indicators uh, now, in terms of the share of workers, as I have already mentioned, that for the tertiary and the secondary educated workers, over time, in recent years, there has been a decline. In terms of the share of workers in the different skill component, uh, in the first stage of our analysis, uh, we have seen sort of an indication of job polarization because there has been a reduction in the mid-skill occupation people. But in the latest stage of the uh, uh, analysis, it seems that there has been a shift from the low skill to the mid skill. So over time, on an average, we can say there has been an increase in the mid skill and the high skill uh, people. Uh, when we look at the earnings, then we have seen that uh, across more or less all of the education classes, we have seen there has been an increase in earning, re real earning. And, um, um, uh, when we look at the education premium uh, for almost all of the classes, uh, they have enjoyed education premium, and they, but the education premium was the steepest for those who, who have tertiary level education. Uh, in terms of the polarization, if you look at it, then we've seen that uh, uh, in the first stage, we don't see employment polarization, but in the second part, we see uh, some indication of polarization. So, on an average, while combining our result with some of the graphical analysis, which we, which I am not showing here, we have seen that there is no. Uh, we cannot come to the conclusion that there is any polarization. So there is no. There has not been any employment polarization over time. In terms of country uh, RTI, we have seen a, a fall. So we can say that um, over time there has been a decline in the share of occupation, which involves more routine staff. In the next stage of our analysis, next. Next slide, please. Uh, we have applied two decomposition methods, Shapley decomposition method and RIS decomposition method uh, to dig into more detail into the inequality. Shapley decomposition, uh, which uh, I'm not showing it here, uh, that has in fact shown that uh, in the, the first part of our analysis, so 2005 to 2010, there has been the uh, bidding uh, occupation inequality was more prominent. And in the second part, the between occupation became more stronger. Reef decomposition, which in fact uh, looking at uh, different uh, uh, factors contribution to the inequality, that shows that the importance of routine task intensity, RTI, and education, that has been the more dominant factor. Uh, but the interesting thing is in the first stage of our analysis, routine task intensity sort of having a pro-reach effect. On the other hand, the education, if you look at the uh, different quintiles uh, distribution, then we can see that uh, education sort of have a pro-poor effect. But when we look in 2010 to 2016, 17, then the result seems that the effect of education is not that prominent. Rather, we see that RTI is playing the key role. And uh, on an average, maybe we can say that the role of RTI is here. We see that it is more pro poor so combining these two things the inequality can be we can say in the, in the context of bangladesh the uh, role of rti has become more and more important in explaining the earning differences across across occupation so if we go into the next slide uh, then uh, we can combine our result and we can say that uh, over time in the context of bangladesh we observed a shift towards more educated and better skilled workers. Returns to education seems to have increased over time, and that is more prominent when we look in, uh, into those who have a tertiary education. There has been a shift towards jobs which, which involve mid-skill and high-skill jobs, and also those jobs which is less routine intensive and which is more analytical and more cognitive in nature. Uh, in terms of inequality, it has declined uh, in the, when we look at the labor earnings, but we must keep in mind that there are also some other various factors like the uh, institutional factors, then the issue of uh, uh, um, tax to GDP ratio. These has to also be taken into account when we think about the overall inequality in the country. As for the implication, there are like two points I would like to highlight is because because we have seen the education premium for the tertiary educated worker is so high, 
that's why the education policies and the labor market policies they should be strongly integrated and there is a skill mismatch and all of these factors which are concerning our labor market that should be keeping in, uh, into account while designing the labor market policy and secondly because the uh, uh, reduction of the decline in the share of uh, routine intensive tasks the more training and uh, uh, training program has to be designed in involving more uh, tasks which are more uh, which involve more cognitive skill and less routine intensive tasks so i will stop here thank you very much Thanks, Patricia. That is very nice because we are all very much in time. Uh, not seeing any questions on the, in the chat yet, so please send the questions as you start thinking about them. But let me ask a question to Pong Lee. So, Pong Lee, why do you think the revolution plays such an important role in the nature of what you see in terms of earnings and employment? What, is the, what was the nature of the structural break that happened in the revolution? Yeah, actually, the public sectors, they um, occupy a large part of the active population in Tunisia. Before the revolution, uh, as our data suggests, in 2000, the public sector occupied like 45% of the uh, active population, and that's a very large part. And Actually, um, in the public sector, the wage, um, the wage policy in the public sector is always higher than the wage policy in the private sector. So before the revolution, it really had a, a disequalizing effect. However, after the revolution, um, the public sector actually it's reduced, uh, like half of the most of the reduction comes from the privatization. So the public sector occupies uh, 20, 25, and all most of them are the public administration. And also in the second period, um, also which uh, in the public sector will keep higher than in the private sector, it has no um, uh, disequalizing, uh, it has no um, effect on the earning distribution. That is to say, the which the um, average wage in the public sector all is higher than average wage in the private sector, but it has no effect on it um, on the distribution at all. So mostly it's come from the wage policy of the public sector. Thank you. That was a very comprehensive, comprehensive answer. I don't see any uh, any chat question in the chat yet. But I, can, I think we can carry on to the next set of presentations. And for those who have questions that you're thinking about for the first three presenters, you can always keep on sending them, and we can take them at the end of the presentations. So let's move on. The next presentation is by Kanika Mahajan from Ashoka University on India. Uh, thanks, Kunal. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thanks uh, for coming to this session. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the focus of this presentation is going to be uh, India and the changing wage inequality in India and the effect of changing uh, occupation structure and the routine task intensity in the country in affecting the direction in which we see the wage inequality to be moving. Uh, next slide, please. So just to set the context, uh, here we give a brief overview of the Indian economy. Uh, we have the base values for 2004, since we're looking at changes in these macroeconomic variables since 2000 uh, for this uh, analysis. Overall, we find that GDP growth has been pretty robust for the country since 2000. There has actually been a decline in wage inequality over time, and this decline has been larger. These red um, cells that we see reflect the decline in wage inequality over time, which has become steeper since 2011. Uh, the main variable of interest uh, in this analysis. The urban workforce structure has changed towards more of construction-based activity and reduction in agriculture-based activity. There has been an increase in education, a steep increase, especially in tertiary education. However, this has been accompanied by a decline in the education premium. On the other hand, if one looks at job polarization, we find that there has been uh, intense job polarization in urban uh, labor markets of the country, where the middle sector, uh, where, where the mid-skill jobs have shown a sharp decline, and the high skill and the low-skill jobs have shown a sharp increase since 2000. There has also been a substantial decline in the routine intensity of the jobs, and we see that 
especially in the decade of 2004 to 2011. There was a steep decline in the routine task intensity, whether we look at the country specific or the ONET measures to measure RTI. Whereas between uh, since 2011, these uh, uh, routine task intensities have been pretty stable. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here we uh, decompose the changing wage inequality, which we have seen has fallen over the last um, two decades in the country. We find that there has been a steeper decline since 2011. And here we break it down into the part which is explained by the changing factors like age, education, uh, religion, class structure, as well as, of, as well as the routine task intensity uh, of these jobs. We divide our analysis into two periods. Uh, our main finding is that the changing composition of the workforce uh, due to these factors has not really resulted in any change or decline in wage inequality that we see in our main analysis. What has really contributed to the decline in wage inequality, especially since 2011, has been the changing returns to these characteristics. So what we do is that we plot the changing returns by quantile, yeah? And we show for each quantile what has been the contribution of each of these characteristics towards the change in earnings for that particular quantile. So if we see a negative effect here, it's basically saying that that factor has contributed towards a decline in wages for that particular quantile. So here we clearly see, for example, for 2004 to 2011, that education has led to a decline in wages for the mid-level jobs, middle learning jobs, whereas it's increased uh, the earnings at the high end and at the lowest end somewhat. And overall, we'll see that it has had a disequalizing effect because of this large negative effect in the middle part of the wage distribution. This pattern continues in 2011, 2017 as well, with this large uh, declining return, like the returns to education playing a role in, in decrease in uh, earnings uh, in, the, in the middle part of the distribution, whereas there's an increase in earnings towards the higher end of the distribution. The routine task intensity, on the other hand, has had the opposite effect. So what's fine is that uh, in the middle part of the earnings distribution, the routine task intensity has led to an increase in earnings in both the time periods, thus having an equalizing effect on the wage, uh, on the wage inequality structure. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so overall, we have seen that wage inequality has fallen in India. Uh, and the major factor responsible for this has been a change in returns to attributes over time, especially returns to education, which have been uh, pro-rich, whereas the returns to RTI, which have been pro-poor. Uh, however, one must note that economic factors are not the only factors which, which affect uh, wage formation in the country. Institutional factors are equally important. Uh, and uh, our preliminary findings are indicating that the changing structure of minimum wages in the country, especially since 2000s, where uh, the minimum wage increases have been large, uh, have played an important role, uh, are playing an important role in shaping the wage inequality uh, in India. So I, uh, so thank you. I would like to stop here. Thank you, Kanika. We now move to the fifth. Uh, presentation and the fourth case study by Roxana Maurizio, who's at the University of Buenos Aires on Argentina. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. I will present the case of Argentina, where we study the changes in employment in the job task and composition and their impact on inequality. Next, please. The period under analysis is particularly important because over the new millennium, Argentina experienced two very different macroeconomic and labor market cycles. In particular, during 2003 2012, a strong GDP growth was accompanied by a reducing trend in inequality, resulting in an important improvement in the living condition of the population. In addition, following a long standing trend, the Argentine workforce became more skilled, but unlike in the 90s, the tend to education friendly during this period. In contrast with the job and polarization hypothesis, 
there was a reallocation from low and to a lesser extent from high to middle skilled occupations. However, even when this pattern seems to be consistent with an inverted U-shaped profile, they were not large enough to be reflected in statistically significant results. In contrast, the changes in earnings did not follow the same pattern and those in top. In the context of increasing real wages and strengthening of minimum wage and collecting bargaining, the unearning inverted U-shaped profile was verified. Finally, as a consequence of the reduction in the share of low skilled workers, there was a decrease in training in the top and row team task content measured by using ONET or a country specific RTI. During the second sub period, several opposite trends were observed, in particular in the context of a low economic dynamism and increasing macroeconomic stability, inequality increased. The education upgrading continued, but unlike the first period, now it is it was verified together with a moderate increase in the education premium. Occupational changes were less clear than in the first period, but again, they were statistically non significant. In addition, at the widespread reduction in real wages as a consequence of the acceleration of inflation was polarizing in this period. Overall, we can see that the unstable macroeconomic performance over the new millennium was accompanied by a slight reduction in inequality, education upgrading, changes in occupations apparently consistent with an inverted U-shaped profile, as we can see in this figure, but statistically not significant. A weak inverted U-shaped in behavior in earnings and a reducing trend in the job routine task intensity. Next, please. Therefore, considering Considering all these changes over the, these two different inequality trends, we wanted to evaluate to what extent the income distribution dynamic can be explained by changes in the job and growth in tax content, among other factors. To do this, we carry out an aggregate and a detailed infinity composition. As we can see in the table above, most parts of the changes in the Gini coefficient was explained by the aggregate return to different variables. However, when we look at the individual contribution of different parts of different attributes, we can observe that some changes in the composition of employment were also important here. In particular, during the first period, the reduction of the Gini coefficient was driven by the equalizing impact of the labor formalization process and by the shift of workers towards less routine intense occupations. The reduction in the RTI continued being equalizing although with less intensity during the second half period. However, the increasing gender wage gap during the first half period and the widening in the formality wage gap during the second one were unequalizing. Next, please. To conclude, in Argentina, we did not find economic, uh, econometric results in occupation, neither supporting polarization nor inverted in U-shaped pattern. Nevertheless, we, find, we did find significant uh, changes in earnings. In particular, wages increased in low paying jobs where day labor demand fell along the whole period. These results are different from those observed in several countries, especially developed countries. So the question that arises here is what are the potential factors behind explaining this trend? First, strong macroeconomic instability, together with significant changes in the production structure that can difficult the adoption and spread of technology in this country. Second, maybe the influence of labor institutions, such as minimum wage, collective bargaining, explaining the local relation between employment and earnings, in particular, especially at the bottom part of the income distribution. Maybe we are observing an ongoing process which full realization calls for a longer period of time, especially considering the initial conditions regarding the composition of employment, the skill of the workforce, the position of occupation, different occupations along the wage distribution, the spread, the spread sorry, of technology penetration, among other factors. So para, uh, to conclude, finally, after the reduction of inequality during the first decade of the new millennium, the current situation is worrying because inequality continues to be very high in Argentina 
and even more important, those factors that contributed to the improvement in income distribution during the first year, the first period of the new on the new millennium, we can or reverse it during the last year. Thank you so much. Roxana, thank you so much. So we can move to the final presentation by Amy Taunton on South Africa. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? I don't know why my video isn't working. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about the video. Um, okay, hi, uh, my name is Amy Thornton. I am a researcher at the Development Policy Research Unit in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town. And what I'm presenting to you is joint work with Ron Barat, Katie Lilinski, and Juan Gwesley, and also at the Development Policy Research Unit. So thank you very much for the opportunity to visit. Yes, so um, Canal has given us a really nice introduction to this project. So essentially, what we're doing is investigating um, inequality in South Africa by charting the changes in earnings and employment um, using made market data for 2015. Um, and our focus is on task, occupation, and gender. Um, next slide, please. Right, so South Africa is an interesting um, case study in terms of inequality because we have some of the highest levels of inequality um, in the world. And this is largely driven by the labor market. So our wage genie is at something like 0 0.55, which is extremely high at the beginning of the period of study. And it's, it's really like stayed at that really high level throughout and even started to increase towards the end of the period. Or there is, so there is some, there are some questions about gay equality. And generally, um, a lot of work has been done on inequality in South Africa. And there is some consensus that um, returns in terms of wages have really accrued to that top decile. And, and investigation is about why that is, why that is the case. Um, and a key characteristic um, of both job and wage growth over this period is that it has been um, skills wise. So if you look at the figure here, what, um, what I'm showing here um, is an annual average growth rate for wages across the earnings distribution um, between 2000 and 2015 for men and women. And you can see that it is uh, quite U-shaped for women, but a bit more uh, monotonic for men and um, increasing for men. Um, and you can also see employment change there for uh, across skill categories for men and women. And you can see that in both of these plots for wages, you can see returns um, accruing to the top end. Um, and in terms of employment, a lot of the job growth has been for high skilled occupations. And so for us, that is managers and professionals. Now, behind these important changes, or these key changes that we are investigating, there have been some important um, um, changes in terms of the schooling sector and in terms of sector. So the main changes here in terms of the wage structure, what we think the most important, one of the most important factors are, um, is the changes in the schooling sector. So over this uh, same period of time, there has been a large expansion in people uh, with a high school certificate. Um, but even, even so, um, people who have uh, tertiary skills remain in relatively short supply. So even though I've just told you that job and wage growth has been pretty um, skills biased, skills are still relatively scarce. Um, plus, in addition, there is some work suggesting that the, uh, the skills that people are um, graduating with from high school, there has been a delinking or deterioration of how many skills are really signaled by that certificate. So that's an important wage structure effect. In terms of employment, um, a really key change has been the economy undergoing a process of premature deindustrialization. So what this means is at the beginning of the period, um, agriculture, mining, and manufacturing were really important uh, contributors to GDP and really important for soaking up a lot of uh, mid and low skilled labor. Um, however, over the period, we have seen a decline in these primary and secondary sectors for a variety of historical and context specific reasons. Um, and instead, uh, so manufacturing has never sort of risen to be the engine of the economy that we, we thought it might be. And instead, the service, the service sector has really risen um, in its place to be the engine of um, job and GDP growth. This is quite important. So over this period, we've seen something like 90% of new job growth has been accounted for by the services sector. Um, so what we're trying to do in this paper is really understand this uh, figure uh, 1A. What is going on with these wages? So we set up an earnings model, which looks like all the other papers have, and try and um, understand the relative contribution of different key explanations for uh, wage growth in South Africa. 
and and you do and in our and in doing this, we think about some key explanations. So there are four key explanations that we think about. These are fueled by aesthetic change related to the speeding changes I've just told you about. These are sectoral shifts related to the premature deindustrialization I've just told you about. And um, some important um, labor market institutional effects. So South Africa has a large public sector. We have a strong, uh, high level of unionization. And we also have a schedule of minimum wages. So we also think about that. And then lastly, we also think about routine by aesthetic change. Um, and RTI. Um, next slide, please. So this um, figure constitutes the main result of um, that piece of analysis. So what you're looking at is the detailed decomposition of the relative contribution of these different um, explanations to wage growth over the main period. So we pooled there. We have a pooled base period 2000 to 2004 versus a pooled end period 2013 to 2015. For men and women. Okay. And what you can see is that um, skills or education, as measured by education, have, have remained relevant across that distribution, really important. Um, we can see that returns to occupations for men have become quite important at the top end. I think that's something that requires more unpacking in general. Um, and for women, you can see that returns to industry are quite important at the bottom end. And what we actually think this is, re is referring to is minimum wages. So in terms of that U shape that you saw for women, we actually think that that bottom end of the U shape is largely related to a large portion of domestic workers being minimum wage covered in South Africa. So those are sort of legislated real increases in that minimum wage. Um, and then if you are struggling to see the contribution of our own in RTI, um, it is because it is really, really small. Um, so our conclusion from this work is that we, we, we see this um, routine uh, task intensity as contributing sort of a supporting role. We don't think it's been a major determinant of um, wage changes over the period, but it certainly is related to, for example, collapse in manufacturing on a more global scale. But locally, there are some more compelling reasons, um, historic and context specific reasons about why this has happened. However, some closer analysis has suggested that routine work is probably um, quite important factor for office class, um, which is a vocation mainly occupied by women. Um, next slide, please. So a key change that I've described to you is that South Africa has really um, been shifting towards a service-led economy. Now, typically people think about um, this as a, well, this type of move is associated with economies being richer, but what we want to caution based on the analysis from this paper is that this might not necessarily be the case. So the move to services has certainly benefited at the top because um, people at the top are the people who, well, the highly educated people who are in relative short supply have the types of skills that are required to perform um, the jobs in the financial and business services sector in particular, which is really um, an important uh, sector in um, our economy. At the same time, this type of move has undermined traditional jobs in the bottom and middle of the economy. Um, uh, well, they've undermined traditional jobs that uh, low and mid-skilled people have relied on, uh, in particular manufacturing, for example. And we've concluded what I've just told you is that we see routine work in the supporting role. However, we think going forward, um, it's no coincidence that a lot of job growth um, in middle and low-skilled jobs have been jobs that are non-routine and which need to be performed on site. So particularly, you see enormous growth for women in terms of care work and for men in terms of security guard work. These are jobs that are non-routine and which need to be on site. You can't offshore these jobs and get a computer to, to perform them. So going forward, we think an important um, insight that's come out of this work is that this move to the, to, um, to the services sector might actually replicate and reinforce um, existing patterns of inequality. Thank you very much. Amy, uh, that concludes the presentation. So I have a couple of questions that have come through chat. Maybe others can keep on sending questions. So let me ask these two questions, and they might actually be applying to more than one panelist. So one question is about the fact that I think some papers found that the education premium has been, dec has been declining. And the question is that, what does, is that a good thing or not? So are we, should we be pleased that the education premium is declining, or should we not be pleased? I think, uh, Vidisha, do you want to answer that? Because you find that in your work. Danika, too. So, Vidisha, you want to go first? Hi. Yeah. Um, so, let me first answer this question. 
So in the case of Tunisia, we find that uh, the education premium uh, reduced. But personally, I think that this is all, all maybe uh, education premium reductions. It's reduced inequality, but it will keep like um, uh, the economy at the lower um, equilibrium. I mean. It's reduced the um, income at the upper end, and it's keep the lower end still low. So it's bad for for um, personally. I think the reductions of uh, education premium it's not a good thing to do. We should try to improve the equalities in another way rather than reduce the overall um, education premium. Uh, Bidisha, do you want to reflect on this question? Okay. Uh, in case of Bangladesh, in fact, we have found uh, the opposite results. So education premium has been increasing over time. And especially when we are looking at uh, the, those involving uh, tertiary education, they had the steepest rise over time. Uh, and secondary education also for both of the sectors, we have seen a rise. So that seems to be more consistent with the result that we have found in our inequality story and uh, uh, wage premium story as well. So uh, education premium increase, that, that's why we have highlighted that we should focus more on uh, uh, bringing people to more in the tertiary and high skill uh, uh, institution because there is a, because we have very few people who are in the tertiary level education. So although education premium has increased, uh, the thing is like because there are very few people in the tertiary education, unless we don't uh, increase uh, those people who are in the tertiary education, we will not be able to uh, enjoy the benefit of education premium that the country is offering. So that's why uh, focusing more on education is, should be one of the priorities. Yeah. Kanika, did you want to respond about the question of the education, education premium? Yeah, so um, so I think that uh, it depends on the factors that are leading to the change in education. So, for example, if the education premium is declining because there are skill mismatches at the upper end, then I would say that the declining education premium is bad. But the education premium could also decline uh, because there has been an increase at the lower end, which could be because of changing institutional factors like rising minimum wages. In that case, I don't think it's a bad sign. I think uh, the fact that you're giving decent wages to people uh, may not necessarily be, uh, a, you know, a, you know, a bad fact. It may just be an equality, like an equality enhancing factor, uh, in my opinion. So that's all. Thanks, Kanika. There is a very specific question for Amy from Peter Leronsky. So Amy, let me read out this question. It's a fairly long question. So the question that Peter asked is that, I'm a bit puzzled that she controls for occupation and own it RTI at the same time, because RTI is defined at the occupation level. So the contribution of RTI is probably the contribution of changes in the task content of occupations over time only. Occupational change is captured by occupation dummies. We don't know the character, we don't know the character of this change. Why are you doing it this way? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, so I, I I thought about this a lot, and I'm I'm glad that we can talk about it because um, I wasn't sure. So I find that um, occupations contribute a lot to earnings regressions in general in South Africa, and that um, even like when you run an OB and you get like that total effect change over time, right? You actually can get quite a different effect if you don't include occupations. So I think excluding occupations is quite a big problem. At the same time, um. I understand what you're saying about RTI being defined at the occupational level, but in this instance, um, occupations here are at the one digit level where they've been included in this regression, but the ONET RTI that we include here is at the four digit level. So it is actually much more detailed. Um, so I think that it is certainly fine that we can be including them at the same time because if the RTI is ready to make a contribution, it should be making a contribution over and above controlling for an occupation. Um, but I'm happy to think further about that. Um, it was my intuition to put it in because I could see how important um, those occupational dummies were. I don't know what you think about that. Peter, do you want to actually just follow up? And you can ask your question, your comments live if you want to. 
All right, so so let me unmute, okay? Yeah. Well, right, uh, occupations will be obviously important, but if you do it this way, then the RTI, the effect of RTI will only, it actually, actually captures the differences in the task content between various narrowly defined occupations within a given one-digit group, and you average all the differences between the one-digit group as they are captured by the dummies. So let's say the effect of RTI is that a composition of narrowly defined types of managers among all the managers changes. So it's a very different, let's say, meaning of the routinization of jobs than what we do, what we find in the literature in general, because in the literature, literature in general, what you capture is increasing share of managers and a declining share of plan and machine operators. So I think that changes the interpretation of the contribution of RTI quite substantially. Mm -hmm. So, Amy, do you want to? I know that Harun is also uh, listening in. Harun, if you wanted to jump in, please do. Um, I'm, I, I can contribute, but let me let me let let, let Amy have first have a go. I've I've, <laughs> I've WhatsApped Amy my views, so let Amy, let, let me read this. <laughs> okay, all right, Amy, go ahead. Um, sure. No, I take Koda's point. I think um, he 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 did, he is raising a good point. Um, I think at the time I was just disturbed by how my total change, my total OB effect was changing. Um, and I was worried that it was a large emitted variable. I must say that I have run the regression without occupation um, and that I do get a larger effect for RTI. Um, so maybe this is something we can think about. Let's move on to a couple of more questions. One is on the role of un trade unions. Now, some of, some of the presidents should talk about it explicitly, for example, South Africa and Argentina to some extent on collective bargaining. But it was not really discussed in the ones from Asia, Bangladesh and India in particular. Um, is it the case that this is because unions are not important in explaining earnings inequality? Or is it it's, it's omitted very probably, I mean, there's a data problem. You don't have data on unions at the level you want. So maybe Kanika, you want to go first? Uh, so I think it's, it's sort of both. A, we don't have data, employment surveys don't capture uh, whether a person is a part of a trade union or not. But over time, the importance of trade unions has, has been documented to be falling in India, especially uh, post-90s. So uh, it's both, it's, at least for the, for the case of India. Yeah, and the problem we also is don't know how, you don't have efficient uh, separation between formal and informal workers in your data set. If you were to yes. assumption that formal uh, workers are protected by uh, or have union representation, right? So that's another problem. Yes, uh, there are ways of maybe overcoming it, but all of them are noisy ways. Uh, there is no clear cut identification between formal and workers. Okay. Uh, Vidisha, did you want to reflect on this? Uh, the thing is, in the context of Bangladesh, a union is more or less uh, concentrated in some uh, sectors like RMG and some of the or more or the relatively organized sector, but many of the sectors like leather sectors and a lot, lot of these sectors, which are quite important, but those are not unionized. They don't have proper unions. So, that's why uh, uh, RMG is RMG and this type of uh, uh, this type of uh, sectors. Those are concentrated in crafts and trade. Uh, that is four digit. So other than that, uh, in other sectors like in the, in the high skill sectors, we have some. Uh, obviously, we have some unions, but on an average, uh, the effect of union in order to capture the effect the union, we should um, it should be the case that union is more or less many of the uh, sectors are unionized but we don't have that. That's why the effect of union uh, at this moment, it is, uh, we don't find, uh, it is not possible for us to 
uh, dig into greater detail. But uh, if you look at the Shapley decomposition, union is one of the institutional factors. So that should be come within group inequality. And if you think about from that point of view, over time, we have seen the within group inequality was dominant in the first part of our analysis, so before 2010. But in the later part of analysis, in recent years, the importance of within group factors became less important and between group occupation differences became important. So from that point of view, I can say that probably the importance of union is not still not that prominent in the context of Bangladesh. Uh, I have a question from Timothy Ship, which is, I think, for all of you, maybe even for Simone, actually. The question that Timothy asked, Tim, uh, Tim uh, Ship asked, is that given that the studies point to how different each country's experience have been, do these studies point to any common or shared experiences that we might think of as a general trend? Similarly, are there any implications that are more general in nature, such as a shared impact of globalization or technological change? So what, how would you reflect on what you heard from each other's presentations and obviously from your own work, especially in light of the literature that we've heard about a lot for the West, that the RBTC literature has been seen has been applied a lot to developed countries. How would you see the findings that you have seen both in your work and others' work? Are there common trends? Or if they are, are they different from what we have seen in the US and the UK and so on? Who wants to ask, answer this, que this question first? Simone, do you want to try it or give it a shot? Um, maybe starting from our global study, like as I was kind of showing in the last slide, what we see when accounting for the fact that occupations tend to be so different in their task content in these low and middle income countries, um, what we actually find is that the shift away from routine work has been way less than one would suspect, kind of. If we see the patterns in high income countries and just use this type of um, task patterns on the other, uh, applying those to the low and middle income countries, we would think, okay, we have this kind of global shift away from routine, non-routine work, from routine work towards non-routine work. And what we find in this paper is that this is not really actually happening. And one potential explanation is, in the sense, globalization or offshoring, which kind of would, it gives support to the hypothesis that especially the poorer countries are actually specializing in this more type of routine work, um, increasing the gap, as I was, was saying, and also that there's still way more technological change needed and technology adoption to actually close this gap between two countries. So this is what this kind of global picture that we are painting is showing. And beyond that, um, also maybe talking about this country study on Ghana that we have been doing, as you mentioned in the introduction, which hasn't been presented here. Um, again, we find rather little role played by RTI, so kind of this more standard um, explanations, like for example, the change in the education premium played a much larger role in explaining um, inequality patterns in most of these countries in this kind of routine perspective. This doesn't necessarily mean that globalization or technological change didn't play a role, but they rather work maybe through those channels. So it's still rather skill bias technological change maybe than necessarily routine bias technological change. Thanks. Thanks. Does anybody else want to think about the big picture question? What are we learning from this project in terms of the overall uh, lessons from the Global South for the literature on routine bias technological change? Roxana, do you want to think about it? Uh, following uh, Simon, I think that, uh, in, for instance, in the case of Argentina, it is interesting to analyze the particular impact of technological change because I, I already said the, the initial conditions and the characteristics of the labor market and the macroeconomic situation are different from, for instance, from European countries. For instance, when we look at the position, the ranking of different jobs, different occupations along the whole, in the whole the weight of distribution are different. So even when we can observe similar changes in each of these occupations, the general overview, the general picture will be different. Maybe different from uh, polarization hypothesis, maybe different from the new state uh, behavior. So I think that it is interesting to analyze specific cases because we have, especially in developing countries, 
different conditions, the spread of uh, and the, 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 the penetration of technology, the technological changes are different, but also the conditions in the labor market and the microeconomic situation that can shape different or can generate different results in terms of the adoption of technology and the impact of the, this technology on the labor demand and income distribution. Thanks, Luke. I should also mention that we have several other country studies, so we're not really seeing the complete picture in this set of presentations. So just uh, that should be also worth keeping in mind. Um, I was wondering, Amy, there's a, a question now that I think, uh, do you want to again respond back to what Peter said? Because I think it's important to get this methodological question right, because it also has implications for other, others in this, in this uh, project. Did you want to come back again on that? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. In my mind, I think that they are both um, important to be there, or at least you should run um, specifications with both of them. Well, we should run both a specification with and without occupation. I understand the point that um, RTIs are being operationalized at this occupational level, but essentially you can get the same RTI across different level, like across different one-digit occupations. Plus, I don't think the one-digit occupations are that narrow. They're, they're, they're pretty chunky. So I think um, we should at least run both specifications because the RTI is like this fine-grained um, measurement, whereas the occupational dummy, is made, it, it, it should be capturing something um, a little bit different. I mean, occupation is measuring occupation, whereas the RTI is measuring task intensity. So, I mean, I would... I think my position is that we need to just think extra hard about it, maybe, um, and um, at least run both specifications and think about um, what it means um, when that RTI coefficient changes uh, with and without that occupation variable. Yeah, thanks. Same. And did you want to also ref uh, reflect on this question of what are we learning from the, the work that you've done in South Africa on the bigger, the big literature on RBTC and its implications for the global, uh, global South? Do you see that the literature has less relevance to South Africa? Or do you think, as uh, Asimone was saying, that there are some parts which are relevant and perhaps some parts which are not so relevant? Uh, sure. So I definitely think it's an important tool in our toolbox. When I think about, um, for example, the premature deindustrialization that's happened in South Africa, for example, I think it's very tempting to be, oh, well, manufacturing, very routine sector, it's obviously declined because this is very routine. But really, when you um, take a closer look at South Africa and South Africa's history, um, that's not necessarily the case. So I think for me, going forward, it, it, is, it potentially will become more important um, because um, of what I said in that final slide about how the job growth that we are seeing um, has a particular affiliation in terms of not being, um, in, in terms of being um, non-routine and you can't uh, offshore these types of jobs. So I think it will become increasingly important, even if it hasn't necessarily been important up till now. Um, and I think it's not that it's unimportant, it's just that there are some other, or well, some, there's a lot of diversity in developing markets, um, in particular in terms of government intervention in the labor market, which in South Africa has been really important. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just thinking that, you know, since I think this is a very important question that Tim is asking us. Pieter, did you want to also reflect on this because you're also part of this project, uh, IBS is part of this project, and maybe Harun also, um, so speaking through what you, what you see from the case studies, not just South Africa, but other country case studies. So Pieter, do you want to just reflect a little bit on what you're seeing from the, from the case studies so far? On, on the big picture question? Yeah, I'll try. I think, I think one finding which is here is that um, the findings are a little bit different than what you find for the OECD countries. And uh, it, it seems to me that, that these drivers of inequality are less related to technological adop technology adoption uh, and globalization a little bit more to what is happening with the skill structure. And uh, that may mean that these low and middle income countries are lagging behind the OECD countries by, let's say, 20 or 30 years in that dynamic. 
Um, that may also be related to the fact that the OECD countries, you don't really see that much change in the structure of skill supply anymore as the enrollment in education are quite high and stable in the last, 20, let's say, 20 or 30 years, whereas these countries record the increase in, in skill supply uh, that plays a larger role. And the other factor which probably explained the difference is that the OECD countries, let's say you have this author Manning Solomon's paper, um, who's Manning Solomon's paper, I'm sorry, that argued that there is a polarization of labor market in the OECD country that is, dri drive that is driven partly by technology adoption, partly by offshoring. But in, here we're, we're, we're actually looking at countries that receive these offshore jobs. So they are on the other side of that equation. So, so global values change are not really driving the inequality here to the same extent because this middle skilled or low skilled jobs are not being sent somewhere, uh, as is the case in the, in the high income countries. So I think that uh, I think that, 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 that is an important lesson because the literature on globalization and, um, and technological change tends to treat conclusions from studies done for the US or the UK as a universal lessons. So I think that's something we can highlight uh, as one of the findings of the project that it's maybe not the case. Very point, I think, Peter. Uh, Harun, did you want to also reflect, while we have over three minutes or so left in the session, on what you see as the uh, an emerging findings from this case study that we heard today? Yeah, I mean, I probably need to look at that more, look at them more carefully, uh, Kunal. But I mean, my sense is um, this is, I mean, certainly feeding off what Piotr said, there is a story about emerging markets or uh, developing countries in terms of. Um, the various drivers we've seen, whether we're thinking about countries, whether we're thinking about institutional factors, uh, and, and I do want to emphasize deindustrialization because Kunal, you've done work in this area, uh, how pervasive that is, and the extent to which those different factors, apart from the standard sort of um, Mansarian um, uh, factors we always look at, right, whether it's education, premium, or skills, and so on, they all those three seem to be really important in thinking about inequality dynamics in uh, middle-income countries. Now, the weights may differ and the importance uh, may change over time, but I think this already speaks to how we think about inequality within the distribution, if you like, far more carefully than we have in the past. And I think it's one of the first few sort of cross-country studies that does do that. Uh, the, the, the addition to start thinking about those right-hand side variables that look very different to to the standard uh, sort of earnings function literature, but more importantly, plug into the larger debates, global debates about deindustrialization, about wage polarization. For me, is, is is has been really useful in terms of the study results. Actually, that's an important point that I think we can end on, which is that. Um, all the case studies, especially the, the, case, uh, the country case studies, all use a, a similar methodologies as Beyond saw, rift decomposition, and so on. So in a sense, one can compare like for like. We're not comp uh, comparing apples and oranges here. And that's really important because from that, we can then get some general les uh, lessons for what's going on in the global south. So I think that's one of, one of the strengths of this project that we're trying to do similar approaches, methodologies uh, across these different country case studies. And then we also have this work by Pietro Simone and Albert which takes us away from the standard way many people approach this literature, which is using purely ONET or, or the ONET um, uh, mappings, which is not really very relevant, as you already saw from the first paper, Simone's presentation, for many developing countries. So we are still, of course, sort of, I would say, three folds in our project, and we're going to see slowly some of the papers appearing on our website, UNE Writers' website, as working papers. Um, and so hopefully, for those who are listening in, you're going to see several of the papers coming out in the next few months. And uh, it'll be great to get your views on the papers and the work we're doing. And so feel free to write directly to me or, or to Peter or Harun or Simone, who's also quite involved in this project from our, from wider side. Uh, it'll be very good to get your feedback on this because we're still in a situation where we are putting together our findings and trying to find common 
lessons and common uh, common issues that are coming emerging issues that are coming across these different country studies. And so, thank you so much. I'm going to stop here. Just past quarter of the past hour. Simone, Vidisha, Bongli, Roxana, Kanika, and Amy. Thanks so much, and uh, look forward to seeing you at some point soon. Bye.